Hi everyone. I'm back today after a long break. I'm in the process of reviewing my channel and cleaning it up. And I'm just going to do a short study on who is the little horn of Daniel and what do the beasts of Revelation represent? I don't have the best microphone. I apologize in advance. I've been watching some videos on Christian explanations of this horn and the beasts and it's frustrating me. I wanted to do a video in context of the information regarding the Herod family and if we actually look at the Herod family as a major player in Bible prophecy and the Bible story rather than where they've been placed in history as some kind of minor character despite the fact that they were major role players in the beginning of the New Testament and I believe in Revelation. I think it's pretty evident today that most people understand the Beast of the Sea to be the Roman Catholic Church or the Roman system after the fall of Rome. Uh, the Roman Church was established. The reformers identified the Roman Catholic Church as the beast from the sea. It says, Revelation 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat and great authority. So this beast, which represents a mixture of the different empires of Daniel and the statue of Daniel, the line of Babylon, the leopard of, of Greece, the bear of Media Persia, uh, and it, the dragon gives him his power. So this this beast of the sea system is made up of all of the elements of those past empires but he's given power by the dragon so and this is why the reformers thought that it was the roman catholic system because and i saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast so we have the roman empire falling and destroyed and yet it rises again under the system of the roman catholic empire the holy roman empire so it says here in this bible last article the following quotations show that some of the most influential protestant reformers and early christian leaders believed about antichrist the little horn of daniel the beast and the man of sin martin luther proved by the revelations of daniel and st john by the epistles of st paul and st peter and st jude that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. Well, I don't know how it can be the papacy because they're confusing the two beasts here. And all the people did say, Amen. A holy terror seized their souls. It was Antichrist, whom they believed, seated on the pontifical throne. The new idea, which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther unto the midst of his contemporaries, inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. So I think it's pretty well established that people believe that the beast of the sea was actually the Roman Catholic system that took over the control of the world, the Holy Roman Empire. But most people will identify the beast of the earth as America. And here's where I think this is wrong, because we have the Roman Catholic Church starting not long after the time of the apostles and Jesus. So according to this um, article here, the concise history of the Roman Catholic Church, we have the origins of the Roman Catholic Church. And it says here, according to the Moody Handbook of Theology, the official beginning of the Roman Catholic Church occurred in 590 current era or AD with Pope Gregory I. This time marked the consolidation of lands controlled by the authority of the Pope and thus the church's power into what he would later be known as papal states. So we've got the official first 
fathers of the Roman Church, which incorporated from the apostles. I don't agree with the official version. I think they've just uh, decided to include the apostles and the church fathers to give them validity of being a direct line from the apostles of Jesus. But anyway, around 590, we've got Pope Gregory establishing the early Roman Catholic Church. So we've got the beasts of the sea rising out of the sea at this time period, 590 years after the birth of Christ. But if the beast of the sea is the Roman Catholic Church and the beast of the earth is America, why was it that it wasn't until 1585 the British Empire colonised the Atlantic coast? So we know that as far as history goes, Columbus found America around 1492. The Spaniards re rediscovered America. Um, and the European establishment of uh, colonies was in 1585. Why is it that it's almost a thousand years after the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church, the Beast of the Sea, is the Beast of the Earth established? And I don't think that this is correct. I think that anyone's view of America being the Beast of the Earth is a futurist version of. Bible prophecy. So we've got the beast rising out of the sea in Revelation 13. The beast of the sea was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given him to continue 40 and 2 months. So what happens in this time period it says and behold, another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So the dragon's giving this beast power as well. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the, causeth the earth, and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. It says, And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beasts, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So the first beast of the sea was given to make war against the saints and to overcome them. So we know that the Roman system made war with the apostles and the saints and overcame them and persecuted them. And this persecution happened up to around the time that Constantine converted the Roman Empire to Christianity. But what came after the Roman system persecuting the apostles and the saints? It was the apostles and the saints of this time that were forced into hiding. It says here, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And after the Christian persecution of Rome, we have another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. So he was in disguise. He was trying to look like Jesus, the lamb, but he was really the dragon's beast. He spoke like a dragon. So not long after the establishment of the Roman Catholic system, we have the history of Islam. And if the Roman Catholic Church was officially established around 590 AD, the Islamic church or system, Islamic religion, was established around 610 AD, which was only a short amount of time after. It says, according to the traditional account, the Islamic prophet Muhammad began receiving what Muslims consider to be divine revelations in 610 CE, calling for submission to the one God preparation for imminent last judgment and charity for the poor and needy. So 
As Muhammad's message began to attract followers, he also met with increasing hostility and persecution from Meccan elites. In 622, Muhammad migrated to the city of Yathrib, now known as Medina, where he began to unify the tribes of Arabia under Islam. So we look into the history of Islam and we've got the wars of the Crusades and the persecution of the people of the Levant area by both the Roman Catholic Church Knights and by the Islamic uh, Crusaders at this time. And we have Muhammad, who is a false prophet. Muhammad is a prophet who is said to have been divinely inspired. So it says here, he was a prophet divinely inspired to preach and confirm a monotheistic teaching of Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and other prophets. He is believed to be the seal of the prophets of Islam with the Quran. So Muhammad performed false miracles where he was said to have, on the Temple Mount of all places, risen to heaven to receive the scriptures of Islam, um, riding a horse named Barak. And the translation of Barak is actually lightning. So, you know, he, uh, if we look at the translation of lightning into English, it means fire. So he rode this horse Barak into heaven and returned from heaven on this same horse, which was lightning or fire. So, you know, it says here that he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, how did Muhammad make an image to the first beast? So just showing you here, Barak or lightning is a supernatural winged horse-like creature in Islamic tradition that served as the mount of the Islamic prophet Muhammad during his Isra and Mirage journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and up through the heavens and back by night. The Barak is also said to have transported certain prophets such as Abraham over long distances within moments duration. So we have here in the Strong's Concordance, Barak, um, Lightning, Barak, Flash like lightning, flashing, gleaming, glittering point. We know who fell from heaven like lightning, which was Lucifer, but uh, I won't go into that. So if we look at the Strong's word for fire, per, fire, the heat of the sun, lightning, strife, trials, and eternal fire. So the Strong's exhaustive concordance, fiery, fire, a primary word, fire, literally or figuratively, specifically lightning, fiery, fire. Now, going back to Catholic answers, the great and enduring heresy of Muhammad. Now, here it says, editors note, in calling Islam a heresy, Balak is speaking loosely. A heresy is a movement of baptized Christians who deny part of the Christian faith. Muslims are not baptized, though the early history of Islam was shaped by Jewish, Christian, and Arab pagan influences. Muhammadanism was a heresy. Not a new religion. That is the essential point to grasp before going any further. It was not a pagan contrast with the church. It was a perversion of Christian doctrine. Its vitality and endurance soon gave it the appearance of a new religion. But those who were contemporary with its rise saw it for what it was. Not a denial, but an adaption and a misuse of Christian things. The chief heresarch, Muhammad was not like most heresarchs, a man of Catholic birth and doctrine. He sprang from pagans, but that which he taught was in the main Catholic doctrine, albeit oversimplified. He took over very few of those old pagan ideas that might have been native to him from his descent. But the very foundation of his teaching was that prime Catholic doctrine, 
Why was it a prime Catholic doctrine and a pagan doctrine? Because Muhammad came from Petra. He came from Nabatea or he came from where King Herod's family came from, which was Nabatea or the combination of Ijumea and Nabatea, which was uh, Edomite or Esau's family and the Nabatean people. Who were Arabs or nomadic tribes of the desert. So we know that the Roman Catholic doctrine is Mystery Babylon teaching and straight out of these regions has come the Mystery Babylon version of Judaism or Christianity. The unity and omnipotence of God. The world of good spirits and angels and evil spirits in rebellion against God was a part of the teaching with a chief evil spirit such as Christendom had recognised. Muhammad preached with insistence that prime catholic doctrine on the human side the immortality of the soul its responsibility for actions in life coupled with the consequent doctrine of punishment and reward after death and you know all of these doctrines are realistically not in the bible uh there is no information in the bible about punishment after death or going to hell and being burned in the fiery pits of hell with demons punishing you there's nothing of that it's just a final judgment in the bible that's it uh, the bible also doesn't teach about the chief evil spirit or that there's a world of duality of good spirits and evil spirits uh, this comes from the demiurge of zoroastrianism and kabbalism so the kabbalah comes from the same region that muhammad comes from and is directly linked to the old uh, Babylonian mystery religions. So straight from the Roman Catholic information, we've got them saying, telling us that Muhammad replicated the Roman Catholic Church in the religion of Islam. So we have Muhammad's first wife here, Kadja. And um, Kadja was an interesting character. She, she was actually kind of like Muhammad's handler. She was older than him. She was very wealthy. Her family were from merchants, Silk Road merchants from Petra, Nabatea. So she was very wealthy. And Katja was a Catholic nun, was the first wife and the first follower of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Katja was the daughter of a noble of the Quraysh tribe in Mecca. Now, I urge everyone to go and watch the channel here on YouTube. It's either CIRA International, uh, Mecca or Petra, Early Islamic History, or there is the channel Fander Films, which is P-A-N-D-E-R Films. Could Petra be earlier, uh, be the earlier Mecca? And there's some pretty conclusive information there that Indeed, Mecca was located uh, and the Kaaba stone in the city of Petra. So Kaja was a very successful merchant. It is said that when the Quraysh trade caravan travellers gathered to embark upon their summer journey to Syria or winter journey to Yemen, Kaja's caravan equaled the caravans of all the other traders. So she was extremely wealthy, like uh, as far as merchants go. And we know what the Bible says about the merchants of the earth, especially in Revelation 2, in regards to around the time of these beasts. Now, the fact that she came from this particular region, the same region that King Herod comes from, will come up later. If you've seen any of the other videos, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to. But just to say here, King Herod was an Edomite. His family were from the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. His mother was a Nabataean, so the same people that were part of this merchant Silk Road route that Kaja's family uh, was a very wealthy, affluent family and probably, I would dare say, an aristocratic family of these people. So Kaja entrusted a friend named Nafisa to approach Muhammad and ask if he would consider marriage. When Muhammad hesitated because he had no money to support a wife, Nafisa asked if he would consider marriage to a woman who had the means to provide for herself. 
So she's uh, his handler, in other words. She was very wealthy and she controlled Muhammad. So we have an article here by the ChristianityBeliefs.org and it says why Muhammad was chosen. This Islam in the Bible prophecy shows why Muhammad was chosen by the Augustinians. Muhammad was born in 570 AD. At his birth, Muhammad's grandfather possessed the authority of the house of Quraysh, the governors of Mecca. Now, as we know, go find out on that channel, I recommended Mecca was not where it is today. It was in Petra. Then his father died and his grandfather died, causing the governorship of Mecca to be passed on to someone else. It was among the Arab converts to Catholicism that the concept of looking for an Arab prophet developed. They spread a rumor that a great leader would appear to represent the Arabs and gather them together. Ex-Jesuit Alberto Rivera relates the following story that he learned from Cardinal B. It says here, Teachers were sent to young Muhammad and he had intensive training. Muhammad studied the works of St. Augustine, which prepared him for his great calling. The Vatican had Catholic Arabs across North Africa spread the story of a great one who was about to rise up among the people and be chosen one of their gods. So we have a, an Arab false prophet, in other words. A rich Catholic widow was sent to Muhammad to help guide him. So this is Rivera quoting again. A wealthy Arabian lady who was a faithful follower of the Pope played a tremendous part in this drama. She was a widower named Kaja. She gave her wealth to the church and retired to a convent, but was given an assignment. She was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. So Muhammad married Kaja. It says Kaja had cousins named Baraka, who was also a faithful Roman Catholic, and the Vatican placed him in a critical role as Muhammad's advisor. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. And it says here that while Muhammad be, was being prepared, he was told that his enemies were the Jews and that only true Christians were Roman Catholic. He was taught that others calling themselves Christians were actually wicked imposters and should be destroyed. Many Muslims believe this. Now, we've got to remember that the Jews of Muhammad's time were completely different to the Jews of our time. During this time after the destruction of Jerusalem, there were still many real Judeans living in this region, real Jews who were real descendants of the tribe of Judah. It says here, the Augustinians exalted Muhammad to unite Arabs and they created the Quran to give them a mission. So here we have a direct information from a Jesuit, from Jesuit teaching, telling us that Islam was created in the image of the Roman Catholic Church and Muhammad was the false messiah that they set up. We go back to, and I behold another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he goeth, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And as I said, we know that the great miracle that Muhammad performed was that on the Temple Mount he rose to heaven on the horse Barak, lightning or fire, and returned again with the Islamic scriptures. We have a list of the early church fathers, and, you know, it's saying the Catholic Church was established around 500 and 80 but when did the roman catholic church actually start and who started it so they like to incorporate the apostles you know i'll go to a different table um you know we've got polycarp here who was a disciple of john the apostle and so i'm not saying all these people were corrupt all these men were corrupt but somewhere in here there was a Babylonian mystery religion people who I believe was part of the Sanhedrin or the people that ruled the temple in Jerusalem who were teaching Babylonian mystery uh, Talmudic teachings in the time of Jesus. So we've got the Ro official Roman Catholic Church starting around the, the 6th century 
7th century AD, um, at some point along the lines of all these early church fathers, they've been corrupted or they've started this church and they've incorporated people like Polycarp and a few other uh, disciples, Clement of Rome, of the original apostles. So bringing King Herod into this equation, the Bible tells us here that in Revelation 12 we have a mystery in heaven or a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the, and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of 12 stars. We know that this woman is Israel. We know metaphorically this woman is Israel. We also know that in reality she was Mary, the mother of Jesus, because it says here, and she being with child carried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Right? So we know that this is what Mary suffered when she was giving birth to Jesus. The child is Jesus. The child is the Messiah. Metaphorically, he's the Messiah. Reality, he's Jesus. So we're talking in metaphor here, but we're also talking in reality. So it says here, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So we also know that the description of the dragon matches the description of the beasts, which are political systems, kings, thrones, authorities. The dragon has seven heads, it has horns, just like the beast. Is the dragon a spiritual Satan in a satanic kingdom? Or is he a representation of an empire or a, a royal throne having heads and horns? So in metaphor, we know in Isaiah that God calls Israel his third. The third of the stars of heaven that were cast out of heaven, out of the kingdom of God, out of the kingdom of Jerusalem were his people, the Israelites, because they are the third. And why did that happen? It was because he had a new covenant with his son, Jesus Christ, and a new kingdom, a new heavens, and a new earth. And this happened in 70 AD when Jerusalem fell to the Romans. They were cast out of the kingdom that was King David's with an Edomite king sitting on the throne and there was never again to be another kingdom of Israel in this earth because we know that Jesus taught us that the kingdom of heaven is within us. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. But we also know too, according to the apostles of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, that when Mary was in labor, when Mary was close to giving birth to the Messiah, to Jesus, she was ready to be delivered and there was a king there who was jealous and was ready to devour her child. And that was King Herod, the Edomite king of Judea. So Mary brought forth a man-child and a child was caught up to heaven. We know that Jesus was caught up into heaven to his throne after his sacrifice by the Romans and the Judean elites. So if we can identify the woman as Mary, the child is Jesus, then we can identify the dragon as King Herod himself. And not some mystical, spiritual Satan creature. The dragon is a family line. It's an aristocratic line and its main head was King Herod. And King Herod was an Ijumin, Nabataean king from the same town, the same place that Muhammad came from. So in his wiki page we have Herod was born around 72 BC 
In Idumea, south of Judea, he was the second son of Antipater, the Idumean, a high-ranking official under the Ethnarch Hyrcanus II and Cypros, a Nabataean Arab princess from Petra. In present-day Jordan, Herod's father was by descent an Edomite. So it says here, his ancestors had converted to Judaism. Herod was raised as a Jew. Now, can we have someone inher inherit the kingdom of Jacob, who is the son of Esau, at this time, and convert to being a Jew or a Judean? Because we're talking about Israelites here. We're not talking about Jews. We're talking about Israelites inheriting Jacob's blessing. Could an Edomite, could a son of Esau inherit Jacob's blessing? And I say no. He was a Nabataean. His mother was a Nabataean Arab princess from Petra. His father was an Idumean who converted to the Hebrew faith, forced by the Hasmonean royal family back in the Macca uh, story of the Maccabees. So we've got the Bible identifying Herod as the dragon. So the Nabataeans are Chaldeans. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was a Chaldean. They were the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers of the Babylonian Empire. And they were the first to have Nebuchadnezzar's dream revealed to them that Daniel interpreted. The Chaldeans were also known as Nabataeans. Now there's a book called Nabataean agriculture, talking about the Iraqi Nabataeans. And historically, our historians won't associate the Iraqi Nabataeans to the Petran Nabataeans, but to me, it doesn't make any sense because they're pretty much the same people. So, when we look at the book, The Nabataean Agriculture, is a 10th century text on agronomy by Ibn Washia born in Qusin, present-day Iraq. It contains information on plants and agriculture as well as on magic and astrology. And we scroll down, it says here, the term Nabataeans of Iraq was used to refer to the rural Aramaic-speaking native inhabitants of the Sawad, now central and southern Iraq. However, it was also used by scholars like Ibn Washia and the historian al Masudi who died in 956, to refer to the inhabitants of ancient Mesopotamia. These scholars believed that the ancient Mesopotamians had spoken Syriac, a prestige form of Eastern Aramaic during the 10th century, which in reality goes back no further than the 1st century AD, and that the supposedly Syriac-speaking people had ruled over Mesopotamia from the legendary times of Nimrod until the advent of the Sassanian Empire in the 3rd century. Unlike the term Nabataeans of the Levant, then the term Nabataeans of Iraq did not refer to a historical people but to an Aramized understanding of the Mesopotamian heritage. Given the perceived antiquity of Nabataean culture of Iraq, Ibn Washia believed all human knowledge to go back on Nabataean foundations. This idea itself was not exactly a new one. Already in the Hellenistic period, a secret knowledge was often attributed to the ancient inhabitants of Mesopotamia, referred to in Greek as Chaldeans. Compare, for example, the Chaldean oracles, a term used more or less as a synonym of Nabataean by Ibn Washia and al-Masudi. However, in contrast to both earlier Hellenic authors and later Arabic authors such as Sayyid al-Andalusi, Ibn Washia was in direct contact with the living Mesopotamian tradition, making his Chaldean or Nabataeans more firmly rooted in empirical reality. So today's historians will not associate the Nabataeans of Iraq with the Nabataeans of Petra, and mysteriously, the Nabataeans of Petra arise out of nowhere and disappear again into history. And they can't figure out where they came from or where they went. All they know is that the water 
wells dried up around Petra and it was probably due to earthquakes and it was no longer habitable. But here we have a historian going all the way back to around 900 AD who is saying that these cultures were directly linked and we've got Hellenistic uh, historical beliefs comparing the Chaldeans to the Nabataeans. So we know the fourth beast of Daniel 7 is Rome. It says, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, breaking pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And the ten horns that were in his head and the other which came up before whom he, whom fell, th whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things whose look was more stout than his fellows. So behold, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So who in the Roman Empire made war with the saints and prevailed against them? A lot of people say it was the Caesar. So it says here, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to cha change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Now we know a lot of people interpret this as being the Pope and yes, the Pope changed times and seasons. But we know that the Pope was in charge of the beast of the sea. The dragon gave power to both beasts. So do we want to look at the, the dragon as being a spiritual Satan being in another realm? controlling these political powers or do we want to look at the dragon in the re real terms of being king herod well, some might say king herod at the time was possessed by satan and that's what he did but i choose to think that the dragon being there at the end of time is an ancestral family line it says here, I consider the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Going back to Herod, it says here, Herod rose to power largely through his father's good relations with the Roman general and dictator Julius Caesar, who entrusted Antipater with the public affairs of Judea. Herod was appointed provincial governor of Galilee in 47 BCE when he was about either 25 or 28 years old. There he faithfully farmed the taxes of that region for the Roman Senate. So we've got this little horn rising up amongst the Roman beast. I'm saying here that the Herod family or Herod King Herod was the little horn. And he met with success in ridding that region of bandits. Antipater's elder son, Faisal, served in the same capacity as the governor of Jerusalem. During this time, the young Herod cultivated a good relationship with Sextus Caesar, an acting Roman governor of Syria, who appointed Herod as general of all Syria and Samaria, greatly expanding his realm of influence. He enjoyed the backing of Rome, but the Sanhedrin condemned his brutality. When yet a private man, Herod had determined to punish Hyrcanus, a Hasmonean king, who had once summoned Herod to stand trial for murder. But Herod was restrained from doing so by the intervention of his father and his elder brother. So the Sanhedrin here are condemning him for his brutality, but later on he becomes king of Judea. His uh, Roman leader here mark anthony named his uh, herod and his brother Faisal as tetrarchs so he was a king and he could also claim the jewish throne via his wife who was a hasmonean princess so here herod was granted the title of king of judea by the roman senate so not only that herod's children were educated in rome they were roman citizens his wife was Mariamne, the Hasmonean princess. So therefore, any of the children from this line could claim 
that they were entitled to the throne of David. So this is a controversial subject because there isn't a great deal of historical information on this, but there's this one website, is all you can find, Henry H. Davis Investigating Ancient Rome, the, the, the Descent of Emperor Vespasian from King Herod. So we've got here King Herod the Great by Mariamne, Aristobulus, his son or their son, his son Agrippa the First, and Herod Polio. Herod, king of Colchis, and Vespasius Polio the First, and it is believed that through this line of Herod Polio, uh, his daughter Ves Vespasia Pola was the emperor. Vespasian and his son Titus. Now Titus had an affair with Bernice, a Herod princess. They were very closely linked to the Herod family. And we have here Vespasia Pola and her other names, Mariamne of Gali, Julia Polio, Julia, Princess of Chalcis. You have to understand that in the Roman times, People had their, like, especially from Judea, they had their Judean name, title, but they also had Roman names. So a lot of the children of Herod who moved to Rome also had Roman names that were different than their Herodian Judean names. So it says here, the data presented here points to Vespasian being a descendant of Herod the Great through his mother, known to us as Vespasia Pola. But what information allows such a claim? It is only when critically investigated the claim parallels of which there are over 40 presented below between the Jewish war, Jewish antiquities and the Gospels and attempting to thoroughly investigate the ancestry of the individual known as Titus Flavius Josephus, who gives his birth name as Yosef ben Matityahu. That data regarding Vespasian's ancestry became suspect. So we have here Vespasian's mother as Vespasia Pola. We don't know what family line his father came from, so they could have been Herods also. The Herods like to marry each other. I've done other videos on this, so please check them out. So just because he was born in northeast Rome does not mean he was not a Herod because, as I said, there were a lot of Herods living in Rome at the time, educated with emperors such as Nero. It says he was lacking in pedigree, but pedigree for the Roman times were the aristocratic families of ancient Rome. So just because he was lacking in pedigree does not mean that he was not rich or from another royal family, just simply that he wasn't part of the um, Roman aristocratic family lines that were born to rule Rome. He was of the equestrian class. The Equites constituted the second of the property-based class of ancient Rome. So the first, the Patricians, were originally a group of ruling class families in ancient Rome. The distinction was highly significant in the Roman Kingdom and the early Republic, but its relevance waned after the conflict of the orders. So the Patricians were the families who were born to rule. They were the elites, the aristocracy of Rome. You could not vote unless you were one of these people. Later on, the Equites could vote and different uh, classes of the Roman uh, citizens. But as it went, Rome was not a democracy for the average people. So Titus Flavius Sabinus was Vespasian's brother. So we have this Sabinus name being used for this family as well. So anyone... Potentially having these surnames, Flavius, Sabinus, could be part of this family. Vespasia Pola, she came from an equestrian family in Nursia. Herod of Colchis, said he around 41 AD, at the request of his brother Herod Agrippa, Emperor Claudius granted him the rule of Chalcis, Col Colchis, a territory north of Judea with the title of king. Three years later, after the death of his brother, he was also given responsibility of the second temple in Jerusalem as well as appointment of the temple's 
high priest. And here, Herod, king of Chalcis, we have a genealogy, and it's listed father of Aristobulus of Chalcis, Bernicius of Judea, Hyrcanus of Judah, and Vespasian, Apollo. And I don't know what's going on here, but it says, um, daughter of Herod, king of Chalcis, and Julia Bernice, princess of Judea, queen of Chalcis, sister of Ber Bernicius and Judea and Hyrcanus of Judah, half-sister of Aristobulus of Chalcis. So it's not saying anything about Vespasian here, but she's born in Nursia. So there's not really much else we can find on this family line except to say if this is indeed true that Vespasian was a Herod and therefore the Roman emperor, two of the Roman emperors that we know of were Herods, that's Titus and Vespasian, and therefore the Daniel's prophecy of the little horn being of the Herod family coming up from the Roman Empire and persecuting the saints and blaspheming the Most High makes more sense. And here it says the siege of Jerusalem of 70 AD was the decisive event of the first Jewish Roman war. The Roman army led by future Emperor Titus besieged Jerusalem, the center of Jewish rebel resistance in the Roman province of Judea. Following a five-month siege, the Romans destroyed the city and the second Jewish temple. Titus was awarded a triumph for his victory over the Jews and celebrated with a triumph when he returned to Rome in 71 AD. Vespasian gave Titus charge of the Jewish war and a large-scale campaign in 70 culminated in the capture and destruction of Jerusalem in September. So the Romans used red shields. The Romans were known for their red colour. And we also know that the Rothschilds or the Red Shields are the Vatican bankers. And I advise you to look that up. We have this red dragon in Rome, the city of Rome, the beast of the sea, the dragon on the papal crest. We know that the Roman legions carried the symbol of the dragon, which later evolved into the dragoons so here we have the dragoons of the british empire but if king herod is that great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and crowns and we have vespasian as the emperor of rome the red roman dragon the red roman emperor the Herod family being Romans, the little horn of Daniel potentially being the Herods, and the dragon giving power to the beasts. So it says, Behold, and the same horn made, with, made war with the saints and prevailed against them. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And we have so many scriptures of the Herod's persecuting the saints. The Herod's beheaded John the Baptist. Uh, I believe some of the apostles went before the Herod kings. And we have the Herod kings along with the uh, temple and the Roman rulers persecuting and crucifying Jesus. And then we have Vespasian and Titus who were the emperors who, in the Roman war, destroyed Jerusalem. That great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now, the devil and Satan simply means the adversary, but we know that there was a serpent seed family in the temple of Jerusalem. Jesus told them that they were the children of their father, the devil. Uh, the serpent seed people. And we have Vespasian being the grandson of Herod Polio, who was also given charge over the temple in Jerusalem. So not only was he a king, he was also high priest. 
And isn't that what the Pope calls himself? The Pope calls himself both king and high priest in the position of Jesus on earth. Is it possible that these two beasts of the sea and of the earth were given power by the dragon, which is a family that sits on the throne of both Jerusalem and Rome and will turn up in the last days in the little season of the dragon. Here we have Revelation 20, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which was the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So what is this saying? Did he bind a spiritual entity in a spiritual pit with chains? Or is it telling us that there was a family line, a powerful aristocratic family that ruled Judea and ruled Rome, ruled the Roman Catholic Church in its early days, gave power to Muhammad because they were both from the same region. The Herod family were from Petra, Nabatea and Idumea. Just as Muhammad and his wife were from Petra and Nabatea, they gave power to the beast of the sea, the beast of the earth, and they had the power of Rome. Has that old aristocratic family that's ruled the Roman Catholic Church through the Roman Catholic families, the banking families, the Pierre Leones, the Rothschilds, uh, the black Italian nobility or the Italian black nobility families, are they descendants of the Herod family? Are they the dragon? You know, we have some of those families using the dragon as their image. And what, were those families bound for a thousand years from having power over the earth, from having dominion over the earth? And then they're released a thousand years later when that thousand years or that period of time, whatever it was, they were, were released from being bound by change and they have gathered together Gog and Magog, the people of the Scythians, and brought them to battle against the earth, the sand of the sea, the number whom is the sand of the sea. And they went the breadth of the earth and encompassed the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now the camp of the saints is us. Guys, it's us in our earthly bodies, our tents. The Apostle Paul tells us that our bodies are a tent, temporary, just like the Israelites in the wilderness. The wilderness, they were in Sukkot, they were in tents until they arrived in Jerusalem where they were given a kingdom. Kingdom and our kingdom, the new kingdom will be coming after this dragon, the devil and that deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, so where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. So the dragon family, the powers of this earth, aristocratic families, will be cast into a place where the Roman Catholic system, the politics, the controlling entities over our lives with the false religions will be cast into the lake of fire where they'll be tormented forever. Now, I'm not saying this is people individually being tormented forever. What I'm saying is, is these entities, whatever these families and these people represent, the powers of this earth, spiritual wickedness in high places will be destroyed. Just consider that these people are in power of Europe and of the Western world today. This dragon symbol goes all the way back to Marduk of Babylon, of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldeans, which is where the Nabataean people originate from. And we look at Malachi. The Bible tells us, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And... So we can see that Esau, the Edomites, the Egemeans, inheritance, 
and heritage was given to the Nabataeans of the wilderness. The Nabataeans being Chaldeans from Iraq originally, being the people that established Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the first king of Babylon, the head of gold on the statue of Daniel. Please consider that at the end of time, when this dragon is released in its little season, that it is actually an aristocratic family line that goes all the way back to the time of Jesus in Judea, which Revelation 12 tells us is the Herod family. And here we have this king who's related to all crown heads of Europe and who claims that they are the descendants of King David and the right to rule, sit, sit on the throne of David basically through British Israelism. This family has no right to claim the throne of David. Jesus has the throne of David. And if they are claiming any genealogy to this throne, I suggest that is from the Herod family who claimed that right through Mariamne, the daughter of the Hasmonean kings of Israel or Judea. And we have the Herod king who was also in charge of the temple. So he was a king and high priest. And here we have this family claiming or people claiming in their name that they are descendants of King David. I believe that they've actually put out that they are king uh, descendants of King David. So just, just think on, ponder on that. Like we have the dragon in Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. We have the dragon on the city of London. We have the dragon as King Charles's symbol. We have the dragon families banking families the red shields the rothschilds and we have these families that have ruled europe through the roman empire the holy roman empire since the fall of rome itself and i don't think these people have gone away i think their power was withheld for a short time as the bible says the dragon was chained for a thousand years it had its power taken away from it over the whole earth but at some point in our recent history it's been given this power back to fully control our earth and it does and it's times coming to an end so just consider that the dragon is not a spiritual entity that is hiding away in a, a secret realm of satan the devil it's actually a family line that's in opposition to that of Abraham and Jacob, and it's out to claim the inheritance of Abraham and Jacob. Uh, it's a descendant of Esau, and Esau hated Jacob because he claimed his birthright, and these people are taking this earth as their birthright. Thanks again.